Binbar is a very big village. It's well established. There were nice clear roads through it, uh, bananas growing all around. The uh, huts are uh, not just your average little tin huts, they were well established. It was uh, something like 50 or 60 houses in the, the village itself. It was a French rubber plantation village. Everyone lived in little brick cottages laid out on a formal grid pattern, totally different to what you would expect for a South Vietnamese village. There was a lovely big airstrip uh, in the middle of the rubber plantation. The plantation managers lived in lovely big 1930s style houses with white plastered walls outside and uh, they had it good. Um, but of course that village, because it was the, the centre of economic activity in the northern part of the province, attracted a lot of Viet Cong influence. And they particularly uh, used to come and, and tax people and uh, collect rice and, and other things that they needed. After the cordon, the first cordon and search there, I've been by, um, Charlie Company stayed there um, astride the old airstrip that was there just out to the, not actually inside the village, but just adjacent to the village. And we patrolled uh, mainly out to the north and to the west um, of Binbar village to provide security to it. The, the thing about cordon and search operations, that's why um, uh, it, it's, it's very difficult. You'll get in there and get an immediate result, but unless you stay there and provide a continuing presence, people from the other side are going to come back in there. And that's why a village like Wa Long was done so many times. And uh, later on, I mean, we spent a lot of time at Bin Bar, and that was, I think that was, we did that probably twice when we were there. But then when 5RAR returned on its next trip to Vietnam, about 18 months later, two years later, they had the major battle at Bin Bar, the same place where we'd, we'd lived for several times. So unless you provided that continuing presence, it was, you, you could never say that once been in there, you've done a coordinate search, you've captured these people or these sympathisers, whatever, and two weeks later it can be back to where it was. On the 6th of June in 1969, uh, an Australian tank and a recovery vehicle was steaming up the highway to join our 6th Battalion, which was north of the village. Uh, well north of the village, fighting against headquarters of 33 regiment. Well north, uh, you know, 20 or 30 kilometres away. Uh, and they passed through at, uh, at 8 o'clock in the morning through the village of Binbar, and all of a sudden some idiot of a North Vietnamese soldier fired an RPG rocket and hit our tank. Now, the big question is, and I ask it all the time, why did this happen? They knew the minute they fired something they were going to be hit back. I believe it was ill-discipline on the part of a soldier who saw this wonderful target just passing past out, so he fires an RPG and hits the tank. Uh, knowing full well that the task force just down the road would have to react violently to a thing like that. Some people also say perhaps they were being very wise tactically with 6th Battalion, our 6th Battalion, which was fighting the headquarters of, of their regiment up the road, uh, maybe they were doing this to divert attention so that their headquarters could escape from 6th Battalion. We well, first heard about Bin Bar when the troop was uh, on red reaction duty uh, at Nui Dat, and we were told that uh, some fighting had broken out up the road. Uh, not long after that, I was called to the task force headquarters and uh, given a brief with uh, Major Murray Blake, who was the commanding the infantry company, and we had to meet a tank troop on the way. And we were told simply that there'd been a tank fired on and uh, that the village had been invaded, but we didn't know who, how many, or any real deal detail, and not much information was forthcoming. So we loaded up the infantry and headed up to Bin Bar, and uh, on the way we were ambushed, but we had been prepared for that, so we shot through the ambush and, and carried on. Then all of a sudden, the uh, brigadier says, uh, there's more up there than we think. I want you to send another company up and you go up and take uh, charge of the operation so 6th Battalion can get on with this work further up the road. So I deploy my B Company and Pioneers and, uh, and another platoon, a tracker platoon, up to there. And I then go up and take charge of the battle. And I uh, 
land in a helicopter right on the outskirts of the village and set up a, a, a little post in the, on, the, on a paddy bank and, uh, and the battle now becomes a five battalion battle. It was a difficult operation because we didn't know anything about the enemy when we arrived. We moved in under extremely heavy fire and I had been informed there were probably uh, civilians in the village. And so we passed instructions that people were not to fire unless I identified the enemy, i.e. the person shooting at you. Now that's a big ask in a situation like that, uh, particularly when there's a lot of firing going on. We also moved in with the infantry mounted because it would have been extremely risky with a very small company that was available to go dismounted. Um, that further uh, amplified the risk to us and again called for very good judgment at every level. Uh, command and control uh, was difficult, trying to uh, maintain contact uh, with each section and uh, each soldier was extremely difficult. Keeping a straight line so we wouldn't uh, get too far, far ahead of one another uh, was another problem. And because we were mixed up uh, with a highly populated area uh, and, and uh, well-constructed houses, we often got out of sight of one another. The infantry had the hard job when we got in the village. Basically, we got in and, and fired upon uh, the huts where we were being shot at from. And we moved further through the village, the infantry dismounted and actually went in and cleared these houses uh, hand to hand, one at a time. And there's a lot of bunkers in there and there's a lot of people and it was a very dirty job to get in and uh, find exactly where they were hiding. It was it was house to house fighting. We, we, we had to get inside the house. We had to search the house um, from top to bottom. And uh, to do that, we, we split up into uh, two or three men teams, and each team would look after uh, um, his allocated area or house or houses. We'd lined up in a, a battle formation and commenced the assault. Uh, we'd only just commenced, and uh, there were six enemy soldiers entrenched in one house. Uh, they fired from that house and struck one of my soldiers uh, uh, through the neck. He died instantly. The main difficulty in a situation like uh, the village of Bin Bar um, was identifying positively the enemy. Um, in some cases, it was very simple. Those dressed in North Vietnamese regular army, including the pith helmets with the red star, which they wore, and the brown leather webbing, and the heavy machine guns on wheels, and things like that were certainly not the accoutrements of the normal peasant. Um, so they could be engaged freely. In other circumstances, it, towards the end of, of the battle in particular, um, the North Vietnamese were coming out wearing civilian attire. Uh, and so they cer certainly um, were very difficult to determine as enemy at that stage. So the orders were given, uh, again, don't fire unless fired on or positively identified as enemy. I could see through my sight the people coming out of the village were uh, North Vietnamese regulars. They had the, uh, the uniform, the webbing, they were carrying, uh, the, uh, they were well armed and uh, I hadn't seen any civilians at that stage. I don't know where the local people were, but I think they were hiding in their houses. The people that we were firing upon were, were the North Vietnamese soldiers who'd been in the village, and that stage they were being forced out by the infantry coming through from the front, and uh, we were shooting at the first lot to withdraw. We only fired upon the houses we'd been fired at, and we only fired upon two or three, and then we were ordered through the village to the back because people had started withdrawing. And as we drove through the village, RPG was fired at us and struck the side of the tank and wounded the turret crew. My crew commander was very badly wounded. He took uh, the majority of the, the force of the rocket in his leg. My operator had his headsets off and was loading and he had a lot of shrapnel wounds to his arms and face and he was deafened by the noise of the blast. And luckily I was shielded by the gun and I only had uh, slight wounds to my face. Uh, after we'd been hit, my gun 
started traversing around to the left and I had no control. And I thought the gunnery gear had been completely shot away. And then I heard the command fire and I realised that my crew commander had seen the person who'd fired at us and I fired into the hut that was looking straight at. And he had, had, had the presence of mind to do all this before he passed out and he passed out not long after. I had to stop firing so we could open a field dressing and bandage his leg. He was bleeding everywhere. He had a very large hole in his leg. Took my crew commander and operator, we abandoned the tank and left it, moved out to a point where a chopper would fly in to take us out. I didn't get on the chopper at that stage. I uh, told my wife I had a nice, safe job in Nui Dat. And as soon as you get on a chopper, there's a wound in action telegram sent and she was worried enough without getting something like that. There were over 120 odd enemy killed and I understand there were some civilians uh, killed and wounded, but I don't really know uh, the numbers. Dead bodies had to be brought back to camp, identified by the medicals, checked to make sure they're all dead in body bags. And they try and identify them to find out what areas they come from, what villages and that they come from. And we spent a few days, a day or two there carting them back because they're all, they're not in bags when you bring them back, it's chucked in the back of the truck. That rattles your nerves, shakes you up. Um, you never forget it. Unfortunately, some of the houses have had to be destroyed. Um, when the enemy action uh, occurred in, in a house, if we couldn't clear the house, then we had to have the house destroyed by tank fire or even our own uh, anti-tank uh, rockets we carried ourselves, we'd use those. So yes, there were a lot of houses uh, damaged um, in the village. And uh, what happened after the, uh, the battle was over, that uh, we tried to repair the villages as much as we possibly could. And that's when the, uh, the civil affairs units moved in to start reconstruction. Well, the civil affairs representatives, including myself, went into the village of Bingba the day after the battle. We arrived there about eight in the morning to inspect the village to see what damage had been done. Um, the majority of buildings in the village had been substantially damaged, um, some with gaping holes in the walls from tank gunfire, roofs destroyed. We made an assessment of the damage with a view to determining what sort of materials and what sort of work was necessary to make the buildings habitable again. There was a, a food and furniture distribution. So on those occasions, the trucks would be loaded up and we would go up and uh, we went up and, and did the food distribution. That was somewhere around about um, uh, probably late June, 25th of June, something like that. If the village didn't have a medical dispensary, if the village had a school but it had no textbooks, um, th there were the, um, just any number of projects that you can think of. We might build, depending on where and when, but we might put sports equipment into playgrounds, we might put a windmill in for a water supply. But the job was to go out and see how the village could benefit if we could supply the wherewithal. Binbar was probably the major action during my time in Vietnam in 1969. I think it demonstrated uh, the difficulty of, of operating uh, against a, an irregular enemy and a regular enemy um, where both moved freely around the country. It also demonstrated the difficulty in identifying uh, enemy from, from friendly people or innocent civilians. It was important too because the North Vietnamese had moved into there and stated they were going to stay there for three days and the Australians would not be able to move them. So it was a direct challenge to the Australian authority in the area and the first challenge since the Battle of Long Tan in 1966. It was also important, I believe, that we reacted as quickly as we did uh, and we moved them out as quickly as we did. <laughs>